Good evening, everyone. It's so great to see so many familiar faces in the room tonight and so many familiar names online. I'm Ashley Walters. I'm an assistant professor of Jewish studies here at the college, and I'm also director of the Perlstein Lipov Center for Southern Jewish Culture. I have the distinct pleasure of hosting tonight's event, as well as our special guest, who I will introduce in just a second. Uh, the plan is for our guest to share her work with you for about a half hour, and then we'll open up the floor to questions from the audience, both in person and online. If you are online, you can feel free to enter your questions into the chat box, and we will be sure that they are read aloud during the event tonight. Uh, tonight's event is sponsored by the Zucker Goldberg Center for Holocaust Studies, as well as the Pearlstein Lipoff Center for Southern Jewish Culture, both of which are housed here in the Jewish Studies program. I'd like to thank uh, my colleague, Chad Gibbs, as well as Kim Browdy for helping to organize tonight's wonderful event. Um, so now let me tell you a little bit about our special guest. Uh, Dr. Michelle Kahn is an assistant professor of modern European history at the University of Richmond. In the spring of 2022, she began her residence at the United States Holocaust Memorial Museum, where she holds the William J. Lauenberg Memorial Fellowship on America, the Holocaust, and Jews. Her research examines post-World War II Germany in transnational and global perspective, with particular attention to migration, racism, anti-Semitism, far-right extremism, Holocaust memory, gender, and sexuality. She's currently completing a book on the history of Turkish migration to Germany and researching a new project on the connections between German and American neo-Nazis. She has published articles in the Journal of Modern Jewish History, or Modern History, the Journal of Holocaust Research, and she has a forthcoming article in Central European History. She was awarded the German Historical Institute's 2019 Fritz Stern Prize, and her work has been generously supported by the American Historical Association, the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, and the Central European History Society. Michelle completed her PhD and MA at Stanford University and her BA at Claremont McKenna College. So please join me in welcoming our special guest. Hi everyone and thank you Ashley for that very warm welcome. Um, for the invitation to present here today, I'd like to thank Ashley, of course, and also Chad Gibbs and Kim Browdy, along with everyone who was affiliated with the College of Charleston's Jewish Studies program. I truly, truly admire this college's commitment to history, to the humanities, and to Jewish studies. And this is a commitment that's becoming, unfortunately, increasingly rare these days. This commitment is a testament to the importance and the endurance of Jewish communities throughout the United States and in the American South. It's thus with great honor that I give this presentation. And as you can see on the screen, as Ashley mentioned, my presentation is titled Hate Across Borders, German and American Neo-Nazis from the 1970s to Charlottesville. And this presentation is part of a new book that I'm writing. In this book, I examined the dark and tangled web of the historical connections between German neo-Nazis and American neo-Nazis after World War II. And my central questions are the following. In what ways has neo-Nazism crossed borders across the Atlantic Ocean? What have these connections looked like? How have these connections changed over time? Which people and organizations have been involved? And how does examining the past help us understand the rise of the transatlantic far right today? Often I'm asked how I came to research this topic. I myself am a Jewish woman from a 99% Ashkenazi Jewish background. I grew up in Los Angeles in the 1990s in a very close knit Jewish community. And most powerful in my upbringing was the presence of Holocaust survivors often bearing the mark of Auschwitz tattoos. These survivors were my friend's grandparents. They were people I chatted with at synagogue during Kiddush. They were people I swam with at the local JCC. And some of them were willing to share their stories, coming to our school, even in elementary school, to give their testimony. But for me growing up in Los Angeles, the Holocaust was something that was in the past. It was something that happened thousands and thousands of miles away. 
It was confined to black and white photographs. And at the same time, anti-Semitism too was not something that I felt personally concerned about. Germans were the Nazis, I thought. We were safe in America. Now, in recent years, my thinking about this has shifted. And it especially shifted when I moved to Virginia several years ago. And not just anywhere in Virginia, but Richmond, Virginia, the capital of the Confederacy and the Civil War. Now, as you know, living in Charleston, um, in Richmond also, the slavery, uh, the legacy of slavery is omnipresent. You might have heard about the ongoing controversies surrounding the removal of Confederate monuments in Richmond, which glorify leaders like Stonewall Jackson, Jefferson Davis, and Robert E. Lee. And so in this way, the United States, to a certain extent, mirrors Germany. Just as Germans have struggled to come to terms with the atrocities of Nazism and the Holocaust, so too do Americans remain continually haunted by the horrors of the past. Increasingly, however, to be a Jew in the United States is to live in a state of precarity. As reported by the Anti-Defamation League or ADL, anti-Semitic incidents have been on the rise throughout the last several years in the United States. In 2019 marked the highest number of recorded anti-Semitics. Uh, anti-Semitic incidents, with many of them concentrated in the American South. As many of you will know, Jewish fears in this country heightened in August 2017 amid the so-called Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, Virginia, a city that is less than an hour from my house. Neo-Nazis and right-wing extremists gathered with tiki torches, proudly carrying Confederate flags and wearing KKK costumes. One of their chants, you will not replace us, soon turned into Jews will not replace us. The Charlottesville protests were not simply a case of all talk, no action. Just one year later, in October 2018, a gunman stormed into the Tree of Life synagogue in Pittsburgh, Philadelphia during Shabbat services, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania during Shabbat services, and murdered 11 people. Now, what has less been reported on is that a similar synagogue shooting took place just one year later in Germany, in October 2019, across the Atlantic Ocean. This was during Yom Kippur services. A gunman attempted to storm the synagogue in the eastern German city of Halle. Now, fortunately, he didn't manage to breach the synagogue's doors, but he did murder two non-Jewish people nearby, including an immigrant from Turkey. This is a picture that I took um, of the synagogue in Halle when I was there last October. There was a police presence around it and still very kind of an ominous situation. The parallels between anti-Semitism in Germany and the United States have become increasingly common in the last several years. They involve not only rising violence, but also shared symbolisms. And this was visible in January 2021 at the Capitol insurrection in Washington, D.C when crowds of Trump supporters attempted to seize the seat of our country's legislature. The man on the left over here is wearing a t uh, sweatshirt that says Camp Auschwitz. And the man on the right is wearing a shirt that says 6MWE, which stands for 6 million was not enough. And even more recently, at the anti-vax protests throughout Europe and the United States, protesters have invoked the image of the Yellow Star of David. And the yellow star, of course, was what the Nazis forced Jews to wear in public in order to identify, categorize, and persecute them. And this sign over here says, in reference to the COVID vaccination cards, the Jews had special passports too. The presence of hate across borders has become so stark that the media in both countries have made the parallel explicit. In 2016, the German news outlet Deutsche Welle questioned whether voters of the AFD, Germany's far-right party, were the same as Trump voters. In 2021, the New York Times reported that Trump was emerging as an inspiration for Germany's far-right. And the German magazine Stern captured this parallel in an evocative cover image of Trump wrapped in the American flag, making the Hitler salute. Now, in this talk, I don't want to debate the merits of this highly contested comparison, right, whether the United States has recently become like Germany in the 1930s, or whether Trump is or was the new Hitler. This is a debate that historians have been engaging with for the last several years. Instead, I want to examine this phenomenon from a historical perspective. And again, here my central questions are about the past. 
how on the ground in reality have German and American neo-Nazis been connected? And what can history tell us about today? I'll make several main arguments. My first argument is that these US and German neo-Nazi connections have a deep, dark history. They're not a new phenomenon. Even over half a century ago, it was possible to speak of an international or global far right. And I'll further argue that the 1970s through 1990s in particular were an especially important time period for its establishing these connections. My second argument is that these connections do not only involve shared symbols or ideologies such as the display of swastikas or yellow stars in the United States. Instead, I'll trace the social networks of actual people and organizations on the ground who are spreading propaganda, enacting violence, and stoking the fires of hate. Depicted here are just some of the main individuals who come from both Germany and the United States who I'll introduce you to in my talk. And my third argument is that this research forces us to reconsider or rethink the US and German relationship after World War II. One of the greatest founding myths of post-war Germany and of the Cold War is that the United States successfully denazified Germany. And you can see here this iconic image of a US serviceman replacing Adolf Hitler Street with Roosevelt Boulevard. This myth of denazification is deeply flawed for several reasons. First, it ignores the reality that denazification in Germany was not fully a success story. Racism did not simply disappear overnight, neither did anti-Semitism. And second, this myth also perpetuates a skewed version of America's own history. By portraying America as the triumphant victors over Nazism, it continues to reinforce ideas about American exceptionalism, this idea that America is only a source of greater good in the world. And this too is one of the ways that Americans cover up their own dark histories. So far to the contrary, I'll argue that Americans and particularly American neo-Nazis not only contributed to the denazification of Germany, but also to the renazification of Germany, to bringing back Nazism to Germany in the 70s, 80s, 90s, until today. So for the first section here, I'm gonna focus on the 70s and 80s in particular, and I'll show how this time period was especially important in terms of the circulation of propaganda between Germany and the United States. Um, during the 1970s and 1980s, the vast majority of neo-Nazi propaganda that came into Germany was shipped from the United States. And yes, to repeat, it was Americans who were shipping neo-Nazi propaganda into Germany, by far the majority. It's important to keep in mind here that Germany was divided into two countries during the Cold War. There was East Germany, which was socialist and aligned with the Soviet Union. But most of the propaganda was coming into West Germany because the United States was allied with West Germany, which was a democratic country, and there was easier shipment and movement between the two countries. And ironically, it was these shared values of democracy and freedoms that actually facilitated the rise of neo-Nazism in both countries. Now, in both sides of divided Germany, there were certainly safeguards against the resurgence of Nazism. The West German criminal code made it a crime to engage in incitement to racial hatred or Volksverhetzung, and it explicitly banned the production and display of Nazi imagery, iconography, and propaganda. But as we know, just because a law exists doesn't mean it's always enforced. There are always loopholes, and it's these loopholes that American neo-Nazis exploited in the service of renazifying Germany. So who were these American neo-Nazis? Where did they come from? What were they doing? So to answer these questions, I'm first going to take you on a journey to Nebraska, um, the, the state of Nebraska, part of the so-called Farm Belt of the United States, which is renowned for its corn production, and it's typically dismissed as one of those states that you fly over or you drive through en route to somewhere else. You probably might not have thought of Nebraska as the home of one of the most important American neo-Nazis after World War II, but it was. I would like to introduce you to this man in Nebraska. His name is Gary Lauk, and he's also known as the Farm Belt Fuhrer. Right, the Fuhrer, of course, the name, yeah, okay, it's, okay. The uh, Fuhrer, of course, being the name, the leader in Germany that people called Adolf Hitler. So the Fuhrer from the Farm Belt. 
Lauf was an ordinary American citizen. He grew up in the Midwest in the 1950s and 1960s, right after the war, this kind of post-war baby boomer generation. His grandparents had immigrated from Germany decades before, but there was nothing distinctly German about him. By all accounts, he was an average American teenager at the time. Well, average that was until he encountered Hitler's book, Mein Kampf. Repeatedly during his teenage years in his bedroom, he voraciously read Mein Kampf cover to cover, soaking in every word of the Fuhrer's racist and anti-Semitic ideology. Soon, Lauch became obsessed with his German heritage. He admired the Third Reich so much that he grew a Hitler mustache. He changed his name from Gary to Gerhard, and he even started speaking English with a very strange German accent. But his obsession with Nazis did not stop there. In 1972, when he was just 19 years old, he traveled to Germany, which he called a pilgrimage to the fatherland, and he decided that he was going to start a new lifelong goal for himself. Even though he was an American living in Nebraska, he wanted to single-handedly reinvigorate German neo-Nazism by starting his own movement. Remember, he was an American citizen, born and raised. So. Toward this end, Lauch founded an organization called the NSDAPAO, which is still today headquartered in Nebraska. Now the NSDAPAO stands for the National Socialist Workers Party of Germany, and the AO translates into the foreign organization, right? So he was trying to create a Nazi party with a foreign headquarters in Nebraska. And the goal was not to reinvigorate Nazism in the United States. He was only concerned about bringing Nazism back in Germany. So one of his main goals was to supply the entire movement in Germany with propaganda. And he succeeded. By the 1970s and mid-1970s, he had become the primary shipper of propaganda into Germany. So what did this propaganda look like? Of course, there was Hitler's Mein Kampf, which, as we know, was banned in Germany because, of course. But there were also more recent texts produced by neo-Nazis and right-wing extremists in Europe and the United States. These included the Auschwitz Lie or the Auschwitz Lüge by Thies Christofferson. And another frequent piece of propaganda was the Turner Diaries, a 1978 novel by the American neo-Nazi William Pierce who was born in Atlanta, Georgia, and spent much of his life living in West Virginia. West Virginia was also the hub of uh, another neo-Nazi propagandist, a man named Georg Dietz, who was also one of the main shippers of propaganda into Germany. In the Turner Diaries, which will come back later in my talk, so keep it in mind, this novel features anti-government militants who are engaged in an apocalyptic race war, in which their goal is to exterminate Jews racial minorities, liberals, and politicians, right, by an American novelist. The FBI has classified the Turner Diaries as, quote, the Bible of the racist right. The vast majority of Lauch's materials, however, were self-published. He had a print operation set up in his home in Nebraska, and he cranked out his own materials, newsletters, etc. So on the left, you can see his organization's regular newsletter, which was called the NS Kampfruf, or the National Socialist Battle Cry, had a very catchy slogan that rhymed in German, trotz verbot nicht tot, despite the ban, not dead. And on the right, you can see some of the hundreds of thousands of swastika stickers that he smuggled into Germany, with slogans like, death to the red front, we are back and foreigners out. Another example of a regular shipment was a flyer that made fun of Jewish gas chamber victims, complete with real hair glued onto it. In order to get this propaganda into Germany, it was not a particularly high-tech operation at the time. When Lauch and his associates flew to Germany in the 70s and 80s, they filled their suitcases with propaganda. They just carried it through the airport. They also sent the propaganda internationally through the US and West German postal system. They sent it through snail mail using secret codes and a post office box. Once a shipment traveled from Nebraska to its destination in Germany, German neo-Nazis would go to the German post office, pick it up, take it home, and distribute it to other neo-Nazis throughout Germany. And if you look at these stickers here, um, you can see the P.O. box at the bottom of each one, the NSDAPAO, Box 6414, Lincoln, Nebraska, with the zip code United States. 
So if you were a German neo-Nazi, you wanted to learn more about this information, you could just write this post office box in Nebraska and get some information. One of the main reasons that Lauk was so successful is because he built, ve built very strong connections to German neo-Nazis. And here's where the social networks come into play. Lauk had a right-hand man in Germany. Okay, Lauk had a right-hand man in Germany, a very close comrade. And his name was Michael Kunin. And here on the right side, you can see Lauk and Kunin standing together. That was taken in the early 1990s. So in the 70s and 80s, Michael Kunin was one of the most important, if not the most important, German neo-Nazis based in West Germany. Lauk was very close friends with him. They shared responsibilities in the organization to a certain extent. Lauk's role was to ship propaganda from Nebraska across the Atlantic Ocean, and Kunin's role was to strengthen the actual organization of the NSDAP AO in Germany, to rally more neo-Nazis to the cause, to find more people to distribute this propaganda. Even when Kunin spent three years in prison, Lauk was able to maintain a foothold on the West German neo-Nazi scene during the 80s through his close connections to Kunin's other neo-Nazi comrades. Throughout the 1970s and 80s, the West German authorities had a lot of trouble policing this organization precisely because it was based in the United States. West Germany had no jurisdiction in the US, let alone in Nebraska. And even though the FBI was keeping tags on Lauk and other American neo-Nazis, the US government refused to apprehend an American citizen and extradite them to Germany. And here's where the most important loophole came in, freedom of speech and freedom of the press. Right? As an American citizen, Lauk enjoyed the ability to publish and distribute neo-Nazi -pro neo propaganda without restriction. So he manipulated democracy toward anti-democratic ends. I'll turn now to the 1990s, and I want to show how during the 90s, this long-standing proliferation of propaganda increasingly turned into physical violence that involved actors across both borders. So in Germany, the 1990s were an extremely important turning point. The Berlin Wall, the iconic symbol of the Cold War, fell in November 1989. And in October 1990, the two Germanys, which had been divided for nearly five decades, unified once again. The reunification of Germany, however, was not an entirely joyous occasion. Rather, it ushered in a rise in right-wing extremism. Neo-Nazis, skinheads, and other extremists all throughout Germany seized on this ethno-nationalist frenzy over reunification to ignite a wave of violence. Jews, immigrants, and asylum seekers lived in fear of being attacked and murdered by neo-Nazis on the streets, in restaurants, even in their homes. And neo-Nazis often attacked their homes directly, murdering residents by throwing Molotov cocktails and setting people on fire. So for Gary Lauk and his organization, the 1990s was an opportunity to flourish. Now they could cross into East Germany and build connections with East German neo-Nazis, where before they were confined to West Germany. It was also during this wave of violence in the year 1991 that the KKK held a rally in Berlin. As we know, the KKK is one of the oldest and most notorious hate groups in the United States, founded 150 years ago. This 1991 rally in Berlin was organized by an American citizen and a KKK member named Dennis Mahone, who had been born and raised in Illinois. Mahone was, on a Berlin, was in Berlin on a business trip, so to speak. He would traveled there to spend a week meeting with German neo-Nazis. And while in the capital city of Berlin, he held this rally. This rally attracted 60 German neo-Nazis and featured a cross burning, which was a common form of KKK, a feature of KKK rallies. Later, Mahon explained that he was helping these German neo-Nazis learn how to build explosives, learn how to build Molotov cocktails, and he was sharing advice on how to, quote, get rid of foreigners in Germany. Now, it's unclear whether Mahon had any direct connection to Gary Lauk, but he was certainly connected to many of the leading Nazis that Lauk knew and that Lauk worked with, including Michael Kunin. One of Mahone's connections was a German neo-Nazi named Ingo Hasselbach, who was from the East Germany, 
and he proclaimed himself to be the Führer of the East. German neo-Nazis often called themselves the Führer of something. Now, Hasselbeck was the most prominent neo-Nazi in East Germany. And in 1990, he became very close comrades with Michael Kunin, many of his associates, and he once hosted both Gary Lauk and Dennis Mahone at his apartment in Berlin. <clears throat> now, most interesting for thinking about these connections to the United States is that this German neo-Nazi, Ingo Hasselbach, became a prominent face in U.S. public discourse. In 1992, Hasselbach was allegedly so shocked by the rise of violence in Germany that he decided to leave the neo-Nazi movement. He was going to reform. He was a neo-Nazi no more. In 1993, he published a tell-all memoir about his experiences in German. And then in 1996, this memoir was translated into English and published by Random House called Führer X, Memoirs of a Former Neo-Nazi. The English translation of Hasselbach's memoir made headlines all throughout the United States. Hasselbach became a key commentator on issues related to right-wing extremism in the United States, and he was recently uh, regularly interviewed in the American media. He went on speaking tours and wrote his own articles. So the question now becomes, why did this neo-Nazi from Germany find himself in the American spotlight in the 1990s? Why would Americans care about a neo-Nazi from Germany? Well, there were several reasons. Certainly, there was an eager climate for such stories in the United States. The 1990s was a pivotal time of growing attention to the Holocaust in the US with the establishment of the US Holocaust Memorial Museum, the USC Shoah Foundation, among many other institutions. It was also the rise of survivors giving their testimony to be recorded for posterity. But I'll argue that Hasselbach's memoir also became important because it was the first to illuminate to an American audience that the United States was complicit in the spread of German neo-Nazism. His most prominent article was written for the New York Times called Extremism, a Global Network. In this article, he directly related German and US neo-Nazism to one another said that the movements were entangled globally, and he explicitly emphasized that most of the propaganda was coming from Gary Lauk and the NSDAPAO in Nebraska. I further want to make the argument that this idea of a global network of right-wing extremists was especially worrisome to Americans because Americans also had their own fears about rising right-wing extremism in the 1990s. And to understand this, I'll travel to another state, Oklahoma. Like Nebraska, Oklahoma is also part of the Farm Belt, this rural part of the country. And like Nebraska, Oklahoma was also crucial to American right-wing extremism and German and American neo-Nazi connections. Oklahoma is crucial to the story because of the Oklahoma City bombing, which took place on April 19, 1995. On that day, a young right-wing militant named Timothy McVeigh detonated a truck full of explosives and he, uh, outside a government building in Oklahoma City, killing 168 people and injuring hundreds more. At the time, this was the worst attack on U.S. soil since Pearl Harbor. And in the wake of the Oklahoma City bombing, Americans began to turn their attention to the question of right-wing extremism. Discussions of the topic were ubiquitous in the American media. Now, this bombing does connect to some of the German neo-Nazis and the American neo-Nazis we've already encountered in this talk. In terms of Ingo Hasselbach, who wrote the memoir, uh, the bombing occurred at the very same time as the English translation of his memoir was published. In fact, the very first line of Hasselbach's memoir mentions the Oklahoma bombing specifically. If Americans wanted to understand how someone like Timothy McVeigh could become radicalized, they could look at this German neo-Nazi, right? They could get inside the mind of an extremist. The bombing also connects to Gary Lauk and the NSDAPAO in Nebraska. McVeigh, as well as his co-conspirator, Terry Nichols, admitted that they had been inspired by the novel, The Turner Diaries. If you recall from earlier in my talk, that was one of the many pieces of propaganda that Gary Lauk shipped into Germany. Ingo Hasselbach had also read The Turner Diaries. This was something that circulated in both countries. But there is yet another US-German connection related to the Oklahoma City bombing. One of the central figures connected to the bombing was a German citizen 
in Oklahoma, a German neo-Nazi named Andreas Strassmeier, or Andy the German, as he was called affectionately by other neo-Nazis. If the name Strassmeier sounds at all familiar, that's because this Andy the German was the son of the politician Gunther Strassmeier, who was actually the chief of staff to the German Chancellor Helmut Kohl. Through connections to his father, this German neo-Nazi Andy the German had moved to Washington DC in the 1980s to work for the US government. Soon he left this job and moved to numerous American states, including Texas, Tennessee, and in 1992, Oklahoma. In Oklahoma, Strassmeyer lived in a place called Elohim City, which was the cult-like compound headquarters of a major white supremacist group that was part of the Christian identity movement. Not only did Strassmeyer live in this compound, but he also became the head of security and weapons training there. In this role, this German neo-Nazi became connected to many American neo-Nazis that spent time there. One of Andreas Strassmeyer's closest comrades was Dennis Mahone, the very same person who had organized the KKK rally in Berlin, the same person that had spent time at Ingo Hasselbach's apartment. Both Strassmeyer and Mahone were involved in the Oklahoma City bombing, but it remains unclear how extensive this involvement was. There's a lot of conspiracy theories about it still. U.S. intelligence reports reveal that both Strassmeyer and Mahone were overheard talking about planning a bombing of that same building. And the two of them had allegedly gone to the building ahead of time to check it out and to determine a location for planting the bomb. Intelligence reports also reveal that Strassmeyer was certainly connected to Timothy McVeigh, the perpetrator of the bombing. They'd met each other at a gun show in Oklahoma in 1993, where McVeigh was selling guns and paramilitary uniforms. Strassmeyer had purchased some clothes from McVeigh, and he had in turn sold McVeigh a US Navy knife for cash. And Strassmeyer also gave McVeigh a business card with his phone number at Elohim City. In addition, just 10 days before the bombing, McVeigh allegedly called Strassmeyer on the phone. So here we have a German neo-Nazi somehow complicit in the perpetration of America's deadliest terror attack until 9-11. Another particularly interesting connection involves the American Kirk Lyons, who was Andreas Strassmeyer's lawyer. And in this photograph, you can see Kirk Lyons proudly displaying the Confederate flag. Lyons was and still is a white supremacist who had also spent time with Strassmeyer at that compound in Elohim City. In the immediate aftermath of the Oklahoma City bombing, Lyons traveled to Germany with Strassmeyer to help him escape prosecution and to plan his defense strategy. Lyons even met with Strassmeyer's father, the German Chancellor's Chief of Staff, at their home in Berlin. Lyons also had much more extensive connections throughout the international neo-Nazi and Holocaust denier scene. He was also the lawyer for Fred Leuchter, the infamous Holocaust denier who wrote the report arguing that the gas chambers did not exist. He also had close ties to other deniers like David Irving based in the UK and Ernst Zundel based in Canada. The story doesn't end here and there's so much I could explain. But I do want to follow up briefly on what happened to some of these main figures. In 1995, Gary Lauk from Nebraska, the Farm Belt Fuhrer, was arrested in Denmark. He was extradited to Germany and he spent four years in prison. In 2000, he returned to Nebraska, but his organization's influence started to decline in Germany. And his organization's decline was because of the rise of the internet era in the 2000s. Right? Lauk's old school method of distributing propaganda by printing it out, shipping it across the country, to a certain extent became obsolete when you can just go to your computer, click on the website and find some neo-Nazi chat forum. Still, he has tried and failed to adapt to the internet era. Today, he runs multiple websites, all with very old school design and formatting, where he disseminates neo-Nazi propaganda, one of these is called thirdreichbooks.com, where if you would like, which I hope you don't like, you can purchase books written by top Nazis, including Mein Kampf. Um, until about last year, you could also purchase some of these on Amazon, um, then they took them off. Um, of course, Love also has his own Twitter account where he describes himself as a book publisher, a free speech activist, and a former political prisoner 
However, he just has 1,000 followers, ironically, on Twitter. Michael Kunin, Lauk's right-hand man and the leader of the West German movement, died of AIDS in the 1990s. He was a gay man who grappled with his homosexuality and how that was compatible with Nazism. I'm happy to talk more about that. Ingo Hasselbach, who left the neo-Nazi movement and wrote that memoir, Führer X, decided to become an activist. In 2000, he founded an organization called Exit Deutschland that still today provides support to neo-Nazis and right-wing extremists who, like himself, want to de-radicalize and escape the movement. Andreas Strassmeier, or Andy the German, who was involved in the bombing, was never prosecuted, and for decades he went off the radar. Recently, it was discovered that he's living in Berlin and he has a website where he sells dolls, like miniature metal dolls that depict mythical German heroes and officers of the Roman Empire, which is very on brand. Um, Timothy McVeigh, the perpetrator of the Oklahoma City bombing, was given the death penalty in 2011 by lethal injection. Dennis Mahone, the KKK leader who staged a rally in Berlin and was close associates of Andy the German, has in been in prison for the last 15 years. Um, he was found guilty of perpetrating the deadly mail bombing in Scottsdale, Arizona in 2004. And Kirk Lyons, Strassmeyer's lawyer, is still practicing law in the US today. And his clients, with no exception, are all white supremacists. I'll conclude with some remarks on how this history sheds light on today's world. In the last several years, neo-Nazis across the globe have turned to social media to disseminate their hatred, anti-Semitism, and Holocaust denial. YouTube did not ban Holocaust denial content until 2019, just three years ago. Twitter and Facebook did not ban it until 2020, even though Mark Zuckerberg, Facebook's founder and CEO, is Jewish. Now, the arguments against banning this content was the very value of freedom of speech itself, the same value that gave Gary Lauk and other American neo-Nazis the loophole to smuggle propaganda into West Germany 50 years ago. With these bans on mainstream social media, neo-Nazis have turned to other channels for disseminating their hate, such as Gab, 4chan, and Parler. All of these uh, increasingly popular sites are unregulated, and they're all connected to recent incidents like the Charlottesville riots, the synagogue shootings, and the Capitol insurrection. So to conclude, I'll just say one of the lessons we learned from all of this history, among others, is that policing hate across borders is becoming increasingly diff difficult because the actors are anonymous. People can reach other people internationally much more easily. So policing hate will require transnational action that mirrors the transnational character of the phenomenon itself. Thank you very much, and I look forward to discussion. Okay, thank you so much for this really illuminating talk. Um, I have the mic, so I'm going to take the prerogative of asking the first question, and then I'll begin passing it around. Um, and I wanted to um, just kind of ask a general question about why, why do you think it is that we struggle to, why we've struggled for so long to see extremism in our midst within this country? Is it the celebratory narrative that we like to tell ourselves about us being leaders of the free world and our values of free speech and so forth? Um, do you think, is it possible we're in denial? What, what do you think is going on here? So that's a really great question. So Ashley's question um, was, why have we struggled to see extremism in our own midst in the United States? Why has it taken so long for us to realize that there is all of this extremism going on? Um, to a certain extent, um, it does come down to this narrative that I talked about at the beginning of my presentation of America being, you know, this bastion of democracy, freedom, right? That we're not like the communists, or we're not like the fascists. America is a democratic country that serves as a source of good for the world, right? So in that sense, Americans have been very hesitant to acknowledge their own history. When Americans have acknowledged their own history, oftentimes it's been about slavery, which is incredibly, incredibly important. Now the efforts to acknowledge and reckon with slavery in the United States obviously are not enough, as we're seeing with the Black Lives Matter protests in the recent years. 
right? But America has also struggled to reckon with its history of indigenous genocide. America has also struggled to reckon with its history of anti-Semitism. So it also comes down to the values of free speech, right? The United States has been reluctant to persecute hate speech because of this commitment to the First Amendment. European countries who are democratic also have a commitment to the First Amendment, but like to the value of freedom of speech in the US First Amendment, but they have also been uh, more eager to police it in large part due to the European continent's experience with Nazism. Um, and I think that there's also been a struggle in this country to look at right-wing extremism in particular as a phenomenon. For so long during the Cold War, the United States was fixated on the phenomenon of communism and left-wing extremism, that the radical right really didn't seem to be such of a prominent issue until the 1990s after the end of the Cold War and I will argue that the bombing in Oklahoma City was really important in that. Yeah, I think we have to um, focus more as well on exactly the last point you made, which is the effect of the Cold War on the whole situation. Where first of all, we stopped the Americans stopped the denazification of Germany because of the Cold War. They concentrated on uh, anti-communism. Um, our, our veneration of the First Amendment did not really extend to the far left. Um, it was there for the far right. Nobody wanted to look that way. The FBI would not look that way. Nobody wanted uh, to look that way. Uh, they didn't want to look at uh, Nazis in the German government for exactly the same reason. And I think a lot of this flows from that and it's, uh, the consequences of some um, pretty bad decisions. Uh, and they were decisions that were made at that time. Hey, thank you. First of all, uh, great talk. Sorry I was a little late, but um, um, I really enjoyed it. Uh, uh, my question for you in all your research, um, generally, do you have any kind of general idea of what kind of drives people into that kind of far right radicalization? Like, what kind of like, pre, like what kind of like presuppositions have to like occur for somebody to really get pushed into that space and uh, to really like adopt that mentality? That's a really excellent question. So the question is how does somebody become radicalized? This is a question that sociologists, political scientists, everyone is studying. Um, what I can say is based on my experience as a historian with some of the people that I'm studying um, is that it has to do a lot, not only with embracing the ideology itself, right? but due to someone's upbringing and the social circumstances that they find themselves in that leads them to start interacting with these kinds of far-right groups to be um, absorbed into its ideology to try to find community. Um, I'll use the example of Ingo Hasselbach, who's the man who wrote the memoir Fuhrer X, and if you're interested, it's really good. You can, I mean, I make my students read it in class, um, and it explains how he became radicalized. So he grew up in East Germany, and this has to do also with the comments about anti-communism. So he grew up in East Germany, which was um, socialist, leftist, and he had a really harsh upbringing, economically disadvantaged, um, and he hated his father. His father was um, very much a committed leftist. And in this sense, he chose to rebel against his father. He didn't really know what movement he was gonna fit into when he was in high school. So he started consorting with punks and skinheads. And ultimately he found himself making friends with a lot of people who identified themselves as right-wingers. Then he was put in jail in 1987 by the secret police of East Germany, the Stasi, which were very, very oppressive. Um, and there he started to embrace the idea of a neo-Nazi precisely because the secret police were calling him a neo-Nazi. And he said, well, if you're gonna call me a neo-Nazi, then yeah, I'm a neo-Nazi and I'm gonna go talk to other neo-Nazis. So for him at first, it wasn't necessarily just that he you know, hated Jews or hated immigrants or something like that, or that he read Mein Kampf. He found his way into the movement 
um, based on the people he knew, based on his life circumstances. And once in the movement, he was fed this ideology and he bought into it. Again, this isn't the same thing for everyone, but it is a very common story in the process of how somebody becomes radicalized. I'll steal that moment since you, you know, spoke about his book as a source. Um, one of our questions in the chat was from Professor Shaines, and he asked about what the sources for your work on this project are. Yeah, good question. So my, so what, what sources, what primary sources am I using for this? So I'm the kind of historian who is like, throw everything in the pot, stir and see what happens. Okay, so I collect basically every material I can. So I'm using memoirs, published materials like Hasselbach's memoir. Gary Lauk has an autobiography that he wrote called The Education of an Evil Genius, which I also <laughs> use as a source. Michael Chunin has writing. So I'm using writings by these people themselves. I'm using a lot of media reports from the time in both Germany West Germany, the United States. Um, I use the German Federal Archives um, to see what the German government was writing about neo-Nazis and extremists. Um, also the Stasi Archives, the East German Secret Police Archives who were spying on a lot of these people. National Archives of the United States, statistics, you know, any, anything, oral histories of survivors. I'll be using. So I'm at the US Holocaust Memorial Museum now, and they have an amazing collection of oral histories by survivors. And in many of these oral histories, survivors talk about their perceptions of neo Nazis in both countries and that they're, you know, about the rising fears of that. So I'm interested not only in these organizations, but also in what people thought about them, this overall climate of fears at the time. Uh. This is a little beyond the parameters of your talk, but I wonder if you could update this. I mean, the beginnings, the form, but Fuhrer, this is kind of risible, it seems. But today, things, it seems to me, have gotten a, a lot more serious. And uh, I'm wondering if that connection, if that influence from the far right in the United States to the, the, the uh, I think the far right party in Germany last election, they, Poll 10, 15 percent, uh, yeah. a, a disturbing uh, uh, amount. And so, is this uh, increasing? And, and how, how does this, how do you understand this based on what you've already discovered? So, this is a very good question. The question is, has this phenomenon increased over time, especially with Germany's far right party, um, the AFD? And if you're not familiar with the AFD, Dr. Gibbs students know from earlier, the AFD is Germany's far right party alternative for Germany. Um, it just polled in September, 2021 at 11% of the election in Germany, but previously in 2017, it had become the third largest party in Germany with 13%. Now, there are explicit connections based on the activities of far right extremists in the AFD, um, far right extremists in the United States who are literally interacting with each other on these forums like Gab, like 4chan, like Parler. Um, increasingly, this hatred is being disseminated in the English language, which a lot of Germans know English because it's commonly taught in school. Um, and one of the most disturbing things that um, I notice about my research or as I'm actually living my life in the last couple years is that that Halle synagogue shooting in Germany in October 2019 the gunman uh, live streamed himself in English right before he perpetrated the attack, right? So that's him signaling he's in Germany, right? He's going to shoot up a German synagogue, but he's signaling in English to this global community, you know, I'm about to do this attack. Okay, so I think it's really the internet that ties together extremists all throughout the world, but also the German and Americans. Get another in the chat um, during that question. Um, one of the students' questions was, what uh, effective methods have been found or seen for de-radicalization or for combating, or at least kind of trying to pull people out of these groups? Mm -hmm. So what effective methods have been used for de-radicalization or pulling people out of these groups? So again, to Ingo Hasselbeck, who wrote this memoir, I mentioned in my talk that in the year 2000, he founded an organization called Exit Deutschland or Exit Germany to help people de-radicalize. He's worked a lot with the German police. 
um, in order to identify neo-Nazis and offer them the opportunity to come out of the movement. Um, they provide counseling to radicals who want to leave. They provide a space for them um, and to kind of help them get out of the movement in a safe way, because a lot of them are receiving, you know, death threats from their former comrades in the movement. Um, so those kinds of things, these local level initiatives have been really important um, in de-radicalizing people. Um, but this might be out the scope of the question, but in terms of policing or de-radicalizing hate on the internet, um, not so much success, right? Not, not very much success. And that has largely to do with different countries laws governing censorship, et cetera. Um, the United States has been very hesitant to police hate speech online, um, but in Europe actually in, I believe the year 2020, various European uh, police forces got together and raided the apartments and the homes of a lot of people who they identified as spreading propaganda online, right? Those kinds of efforts might be increasing in the next couple of years, but are few and far between. Um, I just had a question about like, do the ever evolving dog whistles and jumping of platforms, does that also hinder um, any like attempts to de-radicalize and or like um, penalize these people for doing these things? So can you rephrase the question so the, the dog whistles are, yeah. yeah. So do like dog whistles and like ever evolving terminology on the part of the neo-Nazis and like jumping platforms and such, does that hinder or like create hesitancy for analyzing them? Um, so I wouldn't say that this kinds of dog whistles kind of create, um, penalties or, or hinder, I, I don't know if I'm misunderstanding the question. I'm not it's okay, oh my God. <laughs> um, But I will say that like the use of dog whistles actually to a large extent further radicalizes people, right? Okay. Because you're using something, you know, as kind of a buzzword or a code word for something else, right? And that's, you know, turns it into a matter of um, prominent discussion that then radicalizes other people. I won't go into any recent examples because I don't want to get, quote, too political in this conversation, which, you know, you can't really extricate it from politics, but, yeah, you can imagine in the last couple of years. Is Germany finding, like, we are here, that it has spread to their police and their military, and that when you talked about the police working on trying to deprogram, you know, identify and deprogram um, radicalized people, are they willing to do it within their own ranks? The same thing with the military, because that's one of the issues we have here. So I'm curious, what's going on in Germany? So is Germany finding that there is also radicals in the police and in the military, and what are they doing about it? Um, the answer is yes. In Germany, as in the United States, the police and the military have been a hub for radicalism. I don't want to denigrate the police or the military in that way. I don't want to homogenize or anything, but those are places where radical ideologies and neo-Nazism have spread. For example, Michael Kunin was in the German military in the 1970s, where he met other neo-Nazis and became radicalized. Andreas Strassmeier, also in the military. Timothy McVeigh, also in the military. So to a certain extent, some of the people that I've encountered were formerly in the militaries in both countries. And institutionally, these countries have both been very hesitant to police, uh, to police the police and to police the military. Um, I have a colleague actually in Israel who, in addition to being um, an academic, one of the things she does is consult with the German police on de-radicalization programs. And I've talked to her extensively. Um, she's found it, you know, quite difficult, but there is a willing ear for her, you know, in terms of the people at the police that she's talking to. But still, like, this is a systemic phenomenon in Germany as well. Thank you.
Would you have considered Whoopi Goldberg's comment a couple weeks or a couple months ago to be a thought process within neo Nazism? Hmm. Okay, so we get a little political here, but I will, I do want to actually I will weigh in on this. So a couple months ago, Whoopi Goldberg, um, I guess she's in now she's like an entertainment host, right? She came under fire for saying um, that Nazism. Like, I guess Hitler's treatment of Jews wasn't racism because Jews aren't a race, right? Um, the idea of Jews being a race, as Dr. Gibbs and Dr. Walters well know, is like a very disputed phenomenon. It's a very political phenomenon. Um, to a certain extent, to define Jews as a race um, is to, you know, take to, to make something blood-based about it, which is exactly what the Nazis were defining them as, right? Um, so the move here is that, well, if we define Jews as a race, then we're also associating with them with Nazism. But if we say that it wasn't racism, then we're minimizing the crimes of the Holocaust, right? So I wanna come in and weigh in on this as a lot of historians of Germany have and say that Jew, the Nazism against Jews was racism, okay? What Whoopi Goldberg was doing was not out she's not a neo-nazi or anything but this is the kind of move that neo-nazis could make right yeah so it's this tricky position people have a right to be very frustrated about that right it's very very tricky i hope i've kind of explained it well yeah thank you okay Uh, have you met or interviewed any of these individuals yourself? This is a great question. I have not yet met or interviewed any of these individuals themselves, but I am going to. Um, I met the relatively, uh, I met the part of research where you're gathering material. You want to come into an interview with somebody really, really prepared so you can grill them and ask them hard questions. I want to make sure I have all my facts straight before I go and interview them. I do follow Ingle Hasselback on Twitter and he follows me back, but I haven't reached out to him. Um, but yes, I do plan to travel to Nebraska to talk to Gary Lau. He has in recent years given actually a lot of interviews to the media. Um, and he's the kind of person who likes talking about himself a lot and kind of praising himself a lot, which is why his autobiography, The Education of an Evil Genius is published and so titled. Um, interviewing these people is very, very tricky because just focusing on them and giving them a voice to speak about themselves, right? Why should we let these people speak about themselves and glorify themselves? Shouldn't we be focusing on having the voices of the victims? Um, so that's something that I struggle with kind of ethically when I'm thinking about these issues, but there is, you know, we study Nazi perpetrators. We interview Nazi perpetrators from the Third Reich, you know, we interview perpetrators everywhere else, and I, I want these people to be included because I want to get the full story straight. Right? I'm, it's, I mean, as a Jewish woman in particular, you know, I'm kind of. It's, it'll be tricky to do the interviews, but I'll come to them prepared. Yeah. Okay, so the mic has found its way back to me, and then, so I'm going to uh, ask the final question. This wasn't really the final question I wanted to end on, or the note I should end on, so I'm going to invite you to end in whatever direction you'd like to. But I, I am curious to hear what, what, what you think the end goal is of these neo-Nazis. I've, I've seen some literature written on ethno-nationalism here in the US that kind of spell out these various visions of what this future ideal world would look like. But I, in thinking about the specifically neo-Nazi context here and in Germany, do you have a sense of like what, what the ultimate goal is? Um, this is a very scary question to answer, so what is the, why I didn't want to end on this one, but. <laughs> What is the ultimate goal of the neo-Nazis across the world? Um, obviously it varies. I don't want to treat neo-Nazis all as one homogenous group. Um, for somebody like Lauk, it was simply to make Nazism be the ideology of Germany again, to bring Nazism back to Germany. Um, some of them want a radical overthrow of the government, right? Some of them 
may well want to commit a genocide or a new kind of Shoah or Holocaust against Jews and other minorities. Some people might want to kick people out of the country who aren't white. You no, know, I don't know. Like it's, I guess I'm ending on a depressing note. <laughs> I don't know that the end goal is not, I mean, it's not a happy end goal of the neo-Nazis. They don't want to bring about world peace. So I really wish I could end on a happy note. I don't have anything to say. Can you tell us when we can expect your book? <laughs> that is also not a happy note. <laughs> never, never ask an academic when their book is going. Um, yeah, it'll be a couple years, right? So I just... Um, these, as you probably know, these things take a lot of time. So I'm writing it. I'm finishing up another book that I had started earlier on Turkish immigrants, if anyone else is interested in that topic and racism in Germany. Um, but five, six, seven years. I mean, I hope it's done faster than, than later. But yeah, one day. Well, we have one more question, so we'll, we'll well, I can just say it. You don't have to pass over okay. You mentioned, I forget which one you were referring to, but he was the one, he was gay, who died of AIDS, mm -hmm. and the connection there between his homosexuality and neo-Nazism. You thought you could explain that further? Yes. Have you delved into that? I the have. Psychology behind it? Um, so you're talking about Michael Kunin, who was Gary Lauck's like right hand man in, man in Germany, like this very prominent West German neo-Nazi. So he was gay and um, Nazism is antithetical to homosexuality in terms of ideology. The Nazis, in addition to Jews, Roma and Sinti, black Germans, um, also persecuted gay men, right? sent them to concentration camps. Um, and so Kunin struggled internally with how could he be a gay man, but also be a Nazi? How could these be compatible? He actually wrote a manifesto that's like 60 pages long called in German, uh, it's national, no, is it homosexuality and national socialism. That's the order. And in this German manifesto, Kunin lays out why homosexuality is actually compatible with Nazism on a biological basis. And what's really interesting about this is that Kunin actually didn't like Hitler as much as he liked Ernst Röhm, who was another top Nazi. Um, okay, now I'm gonna turn into a German history professor lecture, but in 1934, Ernst Röhm was one of the leaders of the SA, the Nazi paramilitary groups. Uh, Ernst Röhm was also known um, as gay, right? And in 1934, on what's called the Night of the Long Knives, the SS and other radicals in the Nazi party rounded up SA members. They had Ernst Röhm killed, right? And it's kind of disputed, was he killed because people knew he's gay? Was he killed because Hitler was afraid of him and gaining too much power? The answer is probably both. So Kunin looked to Ernst Röhm as kind of a gay Nazi icon and praised him and then said that Röhm should have been the real leader of the Third Reich. So yeah, it's really interesting. Um, one of my students actually has been helping me with that part of the research a lot. So yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, this was very, very illuminating, fascinating topic and I can't wait until we can hear more. <laughs>